Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Bybee, and I direct the Institute for Study of Judiciary, Politics, and the Media here at Syracuse University. And each spring, we run a lecture series on law, politics, and the media. Uh, and we co sponsor with the Tully Free Speech Center, which is directed by that man over there, Roy, the Situation Governor. Um, the speakers we bring out uh, deal with a number of different topics under this broad umbrella of law, politics, and the media. And uh, today, we're fortunate enough to have uh, a serious working journalist uh, named Steve Cobb. Uh, Steve is the uh, Washington Bureau Chief for the Cleveland Plain Dealer. And in his decades uh, as a journalist, uh, he's made sense of complex events, exposed corruption, and covered stories ranging from national tragedies uh, to entertainment. He's got an interesting biography. He was actually a, a high school dropout originally and uh, made a circuitous route to his life as a, a journalist by getting a GED and a bachelor's degree um, and a master's degree, um, all the while earning money by uh, playing, bat, uh, playing bass in uh, various bar bands. So the man can rock. <laughs> <laughs> he has been on the staff of the uh, Cincinnati Magazine, St. Saint Petersburg Evening Independent, uh, the St. Petersburg Time, and the Cleveland uh, Plain Dealer. He's been with a plane dealer uh, for nearly 20 years now. And in 1998, he became their uh, Washington bureau chief. Uh, today, the subject or topic of his lecture is covering Washington in a time of media change and challenge. Uh, we're actually going to begin with, I think, uh, there's, there's Steve back there behind the podium. We're going to begin with an exercise of sorts. Um, and. Uh, he will speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and we'll have an opportunity for question and answer with the audience. And at 5 o'clock, we'll have a reception right here in this room, which will be an opportunity for continued conversation with the speaker. Please join me in welcoming Steve Cobb. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to begin a time about uh, 12 years ago when Washington had a lot of reporters. A lot of newspapers had offices there. You guys were an average age of probably, what, 12, 10, somewhere in there. And this might seem like ancient history. In, in the world of media, though, it's, it's not very long ago. And there's been a process that's been evolving that I'm going to tell you about and illustrate, in fact. We have a couple people here representing the Chicago Tribune. What if your hands? You're from the Tribune. Okay, you had a great bureau, you had a freestanding bureau, you opened up beautiful offices about uh, four or five blocks from the White House, things were going swimmingly. In fact, they were going so darn well that your company decided to buy the Los Angeles Times. Where's the Los Angeles Times? There you go. And you combined your bureaus. That's great. So you guys start working together, you're partners. But guess what? We don't need all of you. Why don't you sit down, go in the middle. Sorry, but you've now lost your job in journalism and you're looking for something else to do. Meantime, we have the uh, uh, Scripps. Howard and the Scripps Bureau. Who do we have here from Scripps? I think we had a couple. Okay, we have two. Is that right? Okay, excellent. Well, you guys have uh, a, a fine reputation and rich history, rich past. You also find yourself with a lot of bureau space for a couple of reasons. One of them is you from the Cincinnati Post. Your newspaper just closed. You've lost your job. So go ahead, sit down. Thank you. <laughs> but the good news is you guys have office space. And these guys from the newly combined Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, need office space. So cram it a little bit closer because you're going to be really good neighbors and you're now working under the same roof. Nice. I've been in that bureau and sometimes I'm like, I don't even know who works here. I'm running into so many people from so many newspapers. Meantime, do we have Knight Ritter here? Well, the Knight Ritter uh, chain was it was a glorious chain, and it merged with McClatchy. Do we have McClatchy here? Okay, McClatchy, you guys were, were doing good work, and you bought Knight Ritter, and so you merged together. We had Hearst. Where's Hearst? We had a few at Hearst. Glorious, uh, glorious old, old chain. You know, the guy who founded your, your company and your paper, William Randolph Hearst, you probably heard about him. He had a big castle on the California coast, was rich as could be. Over the years, things have changed in the Hearst Empire. Things have slimmed down newspaper-wise. We used to have the Seattle Post Intelligence, or now it's just a website. Uh, and so, again, you find yourself not needing all of that space. One of you from Hearst, go ahead, sit down. I wish you luck in the <laughs> new world. Um, but the good news here is that there's so much room 
over in the McClatchy Bureau now that they'll take you over there. So come on over, stand with these guys. You are now sub-renting or sub-letting from, uh, from McClatchy. Now the good news is, is though your sublease allows you to take in other tenants. So by the time you're done, you actually have people who are renting from you who have nothing to do with your newspapers. You have other people who are renting from you that have nothing to do with these guys or your newspapers. There's all kinds of people here. Um, Copley, who do we have from Copley? Okay, you, you guys, you have San Diego Union Tribune, terrific newspaper. In fact, you guys were so good that a few years ago you exposed a uh, corrupt congressman, Randy Duke Cunningham. He was taking bribes. And, and a wonderful reporter at the uh, San Diego paper in the, in the Copley Bureau, named Marcus Stern, exposed him, won a Pulitzer Prize. The owners were really proud. Sorry, guys, we're closing your borough. Sit down. <laughs> it's not you. We're just, we just can't, can't afford it anymore. But good luck, and there are jobs for you out there somewhere. Newhouse News Service. Three of you. You know, Newhouse News Service operated uh, both the Newhouse News Service and created a home for many of the Newhouse newspapers. So the difference was if you were working for a Newhouse newspaper like the Newark Star Ledger, the Portland Oregonian, you worked under the roof of Newhouse News Service, but they were sort of your landlords. They provided the space for you and you did your reporting for your, your home newspaper. The Newhouse News Service separately did really nice long form journalism, 40, 50, 60 inch stories, long magazine kind of stories, and they were terrific. Problem is, is though newspapers were getting slimmer and slimmer. Now my newspaper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, happens to be, in fact, a new house newspaper. We never worked under that, that bureau, uh, or under the roof of that bureau, we've always been independent. We were the only ones. But I'm writing 40 and 50 inch stories, and I'm trying to get them into my newspaper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer. And my newspaper has a smaller and smaller news hole because papers are getting skinnier and skinnier. How can we put your stuff in the newspaper when we got to get my stuff in the paper and my stuff's already too long? You know, it's just not making any sense anymore. Guys, we're closing the bureau. Sorry, you did really nice work, but we're closing the bureau. Cox. Have some people from Cox? Excellent. And you've done really nice work. The decision has been made, however, that we're going to keep the TV stations uh, in business in Washington, but we're going to shut down the National Bureau. Now, some of you will still work for newspapers, and you'll still work for your, for instance, the Atlanta paper, the Dayton paper, but you're going to have to find another home to work in. You're going to have to rent space from another organization. So, sit down, please. <laughs> Gannett. Nice work. Good job. Excellent. You know, USA Today has really made a name for itself. Papers, some are doing well, some aren't doing so well, but we're downsizing yet again. Why don't you sit down, please? <laughs> and so it goes. We began with a large group of people working in Washington bureaus, and you guys represented them. As you can see, we've now shrunk dramatically. You can go ahead and sit down. Now, the rest of you who are out there, you don't necessarily represent bystanders because there were organizations that were growing during that time. You had, you had groups like Bloomberg. Bloomberg's a, a news organization, a wire service. Uh, they have B Law, they have B Gov. They're growing like crazy. They have been hiring. National Journal was ramping up and hiring. So a lot of your friends who you just saw lose jobs actually found employment elsewhere. But they weren't finding employment in Washington, D.C. bureaus of metropolitan newspapers because they have been slimming down, they have been downsizing like crazy. Disappointing? Yeah. The end of Washington journalism? No, not at all. All this downsizing really is the result of a structural shift that's taken place in the way we all get our news, the way news is delivered, and the way that advertisers reach their customers. The Senate Press Gallery issues credentials to people who want to cover Congress. The press gallery is still full, but instead of being full with regional reporters, reporters from news bureaus, they're full with reporters who are blogging, with folks from Talking Points Memo, Daily Calls, uh, Huffington Post, and, and so on. So again, the congressional galleries are full. It's just they're not necessarily representing newspapers. So the media are changing, obviously. We still report the news. We still consume it, but we consume it differently. In, in my own bureau, we used to subscribe to the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Roll Call, The Hill, Congressional Quarterly, 
National Journal, and for a while we got a national edition of the Los Angeles Times. And by the way, my bureau now has two people, or as, as my sole employee puts it, you're the chief, I'm the Indian. Um, we had eight people, seven people when I arrived there, six of them reporters when I arrived there a little bit more than a dozen years ago, about 14 years ago. That's typical. Dallas Morning News at its height uh, in Washington had 11 reporters, covered the, uh, covered the Bush White House full time. Dallas Morning News now has three reporters. One of them's on maternity leave, but when she's back, it'll be back up to three. And that's typical. Some would say we're the lucky ones because we have survived, but we have continued. Um, but does that mean I'm not reading the news? I'm not reading those, those uh, publications I used to get? No, not at all. The New York Times, the Washington Post, I still subscribe at the office, subscribe at home. The Hill show miraculously on its own. It's a specialty publication that covers the, the events on Capitol Hill. Uh, good place to start, by the way, if you're interested in Washington journalism. It's, it's, it's a good place to start. But I have a digital subscription to Congressional Quarterly. I can get the Wall Street Journal online. My electronic tablet has Politico, Bloomberg, LA Times, Huffington Post, National Journal, The Atlantic, Slate, Salon, Associated Press, USA Today, Fox News, on and on and on. I read these things every night. You guys probably read these things all the time as well. On my, on my tablet, when I read the Washington Post at home, therefore, in the morning, there's really not much news in there that I haven't seen already. It's, it's old news. The morning newspaper is delivering old news. But it's got value because it's giving me, if it's any good, and the Post is, it's giving me analysis, it's giving me insight, it's giving me a lot more information than what I got on the blogs or what somebody tweeted me five minutes ago or the quick hit that I read, uh, even in the Associated Press story, although the AP does great work. But again, if I'm looking for really in-depth political coverage, for instance, the Washington Post is going to still give that to me. It still has value, and the Post is downsized dramatically. <coughs> now, a lot of what these publications are covering is a little bit redundant. Do you guys remember when a Mitt Romney aide uh, a couple weeks ago was asked, how are you going to pivot from the primary election to the general election? And he said, that's kind of like an Etch-a-Sketch. And everybody laughed and made fun of that. We know what he means. He means shake it up and, and wipe it uh, clean and start anew. Now, I thumbed through some newspapers and went through a whole lot of apps on, on a uh, Kindle Fire that night. There must have been at least a dozen stories on that Etch-a-Sketch comment. Now, if you all wrote the same story, no matter how great it was, no matter how funny it was, how clever, or no matter the fact that it really probably validated a, a thought or an impression or a narrative that you had of the Romney campaign, because that's really the, uh, I guess, the news value, if there was any news value in that Etch-a-Sketch comment, Still, would we be really serving anybody by having 24, 48 stories on the Etch-a-Sketch? I'm sure a lot of them were clever. They had to be. How could you not write an Etch-a-Sketch story that wasn't clever or funny? And, and so I'm not, not disputing that it struck a political nerve or a nostalgic nerve. But what that tells me is that there are a hell of a lot of people who work within roughly two miles of one another in Washington, D.C., many within blocks of the White House, who are writing the same darn story day in, day out. Earlier today, we had a uh, situation where Romney um, aides were holding a conference call with reporters, and uh, they were asked about a certain bill uh, having to do with, with um, protecting women in the workplace and equal pay for women. And one of them, when asked, you know, how would Romney vote on that? Would he support it? The aide said, I'll have to get back with you on that. That's already taken over the blogosphere this afternoon. You're going to see stories on it tomorrow. And that's great, except as I'm getting tweets and as I'm getting email from everybody in the world on that this afternoon, I'm like, how many times do I have to read this? And how many reporters does it take to write this? Now, there will be some who do a great job on it, who explain it in a broader context, who put it in the context of women voters, of equal pay, of equal rights, you name it. But there are a lot of people who are just saying, man, he sure blew it, and writing that over and over and over. Yeah, I, I just don't know how much we need of, of that sort of etch-a-sketch coverage. So we've got lots of that going on, and yet we have fewer people reporting the news on, on what your local congressman is up to, what your congressional delegation is up to, news that might be really important to you in upstate New York. So, so here's where it leaves us right now. Money's tied in the newspaper business. We all know that. Advertising revenue on the digital side has not kept up with what it takes to run a news, uh, newspaper. I mean, the bottom line is that you cannot take your digital revenue and pay 
for a newspaper staff. It just doesn't work. It's not there. Will it get there? We'll, we'll see. Hope so. <laughs> Newsrooms responded by pairing back their, their Washington bureaus. I already told you that we used to have a lot more reporters than we have now. And every regional newspaper in America has faced this situation. Some have closed their bureaus altogether. Uh, local example is the Watertown Daily Times. Uh, they had a reporter for ever and ever. And that was really a, a, an outstanding exception. It became pretty rare for a newspaper of that size to have a Washington bureau. They hung in there for a long time. They just recently shuttered. I happen to know this because we had extra office space and the Watertown Daily Times was subleasing from us. And again, that's, that's been a trend, musical chairs. In fact, I'm looking for new office space now, and I'm going to go tomorrow visit the Bureau of the uh, Boston Globe because they're subletting, and I know several other people who are subletting from them. Yet you have a town still full of papers. Again, the, uh, Politico, Politico uh, covers uh, politics like, uh, like uh, uh, Sports Illustrated covers sports. I mean, Politico covers everything in politics. That's a terrific job, tries to find a, a niche, tries to find a new angle, tries to get ahead of the story. Uh, Huffington Post obviously has, has changed a lot, has revamped, has hired a lot of reporters. <laughs> National Journal did the same thing. So you've got all of this stuff going around. You got the Washington Post with a smaller staff, as I said. And it's really extraordinary to me to have watched the transformation of the Washington Post, which had a lot of pride and ego invested in. You didn't use wire copy. You know, if it was big and national, they covered it. They're running a lot more AP, Associated Press copy. On Sundays, they're running stories from the Kaiser Health News, which is a news service by the nonprofit Kaiser Family Foundation. They do definitive stories and, and coverage on healthcare issues like Obamacare, and they do a very good job. They're very impartial. The Post runs more AP, as I said. It runs uh, Bloomberg government stories and Bloomberg business stories all the time, and it runs stories from Slate. There's nothing wrong with this. It's just, kind of, in fact, it gives it more voices, I suppose, but it's very interesting to watch that transformation. I don't think there are a lot of longtime reporters at the Post who are thrilled about that because, again, their own reporters used to cover this stuff. But given the economic realities and this cornucopia of copy, again, dozens of etch-a-sketch etch stories to, to uh, choose from, what do you do? What do I do uh, running the Washington Bureau of a Midwest metropolitan newspaper? How can we cope? How can we survive? And how can we tell readers about things that that their government is doing and things that they won't get in other media. I'm, I'm not a wise guy. I can't tell you about the economics. I can't give you financial advice on how to keep a newspaper alive. But I can tell you that journalism certainly has intrinsic value, and I think that Washington bureaus provide a lot of value, uh, even if the economics sometimes don't make a lot of sense. So what do we do? How do we cope with this? First, we ask ourselves. Why are we even in Washington? And the answer is simple. We're there to cover people, issues, things that matter and can affect the lives of, of people in our readership area, in our circulation area. For us, it's northern Ohio, specifically Cleveland and the, and the Cleveland area. If you represent the Denver Post, you're covering uh, Colorado. So that means we cover the Ohio congressional delegation, ideally in a small, in a smart, accountable way. There are currently 18 members of Congress from Ohio. We can't cover them all every single day. So we focus on the folks from our area, the six or seven from our area, plus the two United States senators up there. It means covering the White House on certain issues. Again, there are two of us. We're fully credentialed for the White House. But if we're over there covering every single thing that happens, we can't cover the rest. So you pick your issues. What's important? Well, health care is very important to the Cleveland area, just like the Syracuse area. Cleveland has a, a big health care industry. I'm told that one out of every eight jobs in Northeast Ohio is health care based or has something to do with health care. That's a lot. We have a health care reporting team in Cleveland that has, I think, about five people right now. So we cover health care issues. We cover what is, is now commonly acceptable to use the term Obamacare. Um, we cover manufacturing because, again, there, there are a lot of commonalities between Cleveland and Syracuse, and one is old-style manufacturing, and there's been a loss of manufacturing jobs, so we cover that. Uh, Great Lakes issues, you know, are they cleaning up the Great Lakes? Aren't they? What's the, uh, what's the White House doing in terms of providing money? What's Congress doing? Are they fulfilling their promises? Are they not? Social welfare, housing, the economy. It means we cover federal agencies, but not on a day-to-day -day basis, but we pay attention to some, like the EPA. Because the EPA regulates coal 
and pollution. And we've got a lot of old power plants that put out pollution. And so the EPA is writing new rules and writing new regulations that deal with those things. And we have to write about them and try to make sense of them and explain what does it mean. I mean, it's health and human services because, again, that's an agency that draws up rules for things like health care and regulation of the medical industry. And we have a medical industry, so we have to pay attention to it. When I, when I was about to come to Washington for my job, first thing I did was actually go out to California to Stanford University, which has the uh, Knight Fellowship Program for mid-career journalists. I went there not to be a student, but to talk to Jim Risser, a guy who was running the program. He had been the bureau chief of the uh, Des Moines Register out in Iowa. He'd won a Pulitzer Prize, and I wanted to find out to him, what's, what do I do? What's your secret here? Because you can't do it all. And he said, you pick what's important to your readers and stick with it. And don't try to do everything. So in Des Moines, it meant covering agricultural policy. It meant covering um, meat inspections. It meant covering the entire uh, food inspection industry. For the Seattle Times, it has meant technology. It meant intensive coverage of Microsoft. I mean, as you might imagine, Microsoft needs a lot out of Washington. And the, uh, the Seattle Times covered a heck of a lot of that for a long time, still does. In New Jersey, for the folks who were at the Newark Star Ledger before they left the Newark Star Ledger, um, and, and they had that downsizing, they did a lot on the pharmaceutical industry because obviously New Jersey has a lot of pharmaceutical companies and they intersect with the Food and Drug Administration. So they covered that. They also covered the regulation of the Food and Drug Administration and the regulation of the pharmaceutical industry. Makes perfect sense. They didn't try to cover everything. Second, we have to embrace the technology. I, we have a blog, a website. Everybody has a website. You know, ours is cleveland.com. I write a lot of political stories for cleveland.com. I write more copy for cleveland.com than is ever in my newspaper. Um, I'd say that at this point, maybe about 70% of what I write is strictly for cleveland.com. Now, a lot of times I'll write something and an editor will say, oh, we're going to put that in the newspaper. I'm not even sure that it, it has the news value <coughs> to be in the paper or not, so I won't necessarily pitch it. I'll just say, I'm writing this for the blog. Take a look at this. What do you think? And then the editor will say, yeah, that's great. Let's put that in the paper. And I might write it a little bit differently. Because if I'm writing for the blog, I might give it a little bit of humor, give it a little twist, give it a little attitude, and hopefully make clear in that that it's, it's a blog item, it's not a straight news story. If I'm writing it for the newspaper, if I'm writing it for what we call the dead tree edition, I, you know, I'll, I'll change it and make it a little bit more straightforward. I tweet. I don't tweet constantly. I'm not, not so sure where Twitter is going. Um, I was telling somebody this story yesterday. Twitter is kind of, kind of a funny tool for, for journalists. And it took us in the newspaper industry a while to get used to it. When President Obama was uh, being inaugurated, I had an old cell phone. Couldn't work Twitter very well with it. It was also a freezing day in Washington. And it was very hard to even work your thumbs on, on a keypad. I had fantastic seats. I was, I had, front row seat, really, for the inauguration. Somebody in the press gallery liked me, I guess, and, and gave me a fantastic seat. You had to get there really, really early. So I'm up there, you know, way up on the steps of the cap U.S. Capitol, and you had to be there like three hours early. It was crazy. And there were the press and VIPs. When I say VIPs, they were real VIPs. So I go up there, and I'm standing around, and who do I see but Sean Puffy Combs. And then a little while later, who do I see but coming up? But Jay-Z, and who is with Jay-Z but Beyonce? I'm like, whoa, this is cool. And I see then Jay-Z approaching Diddy, and they high-five one another. And I'm thinking, now that I want to tweet. But I can't, so I call an editor and say, do me a favor. Go up, here's my password. Go on my Twitter feed and put this in there. They want us to tweet. And I said, P. Diddy. He said, who? I said, Puff Daddy. He said, who? I said, Sean Combs. He said, who? I said, Sean Puffy Combs. He said, doesn't register. <laughs> I said, just trust me. <laughs> I'll dictate to you. So I basically said, P. Diddy uh, just ran into Jay-Z and Beyonce high fives all around or something like that. A tweet goes up under my name that says, D. Puffy 
<laughs> and Jay-Z just high-fived. My daughter was, was in college at that time. And she was like one of my two followers on Twitter. <laughs> and she immediately picked up the phone and called my wife and said, what the hell? <laughs> uh, I removed that, that tweet. But, you know, don't, don't give the, the cool toys to the old guys. It just it, it did not translate so well. So anyway, what do we do besides, besides that stuff? I, I try in terms of looking at um, Washington stories, again, I come back to the lens of, of and I think, I think a lot of Washington reporters do this, need to do this, looking at what's it mean for my community. So every year, for instance, the budget comes out, the White House comes out with a budget. And you guys probably know Congress, both houses of Congress at least, have not been big on passing budgets lately, especially the Senate. And let's put aside all the political talk of is that good, is that bad, is that horrible, whatever. Never mind. I mean, the House has managed to pass a budget. The Senate hasn't. But the White House first starts it all by presenting a budget. It's a political document. We all know that it's a political document. It's the president saying, here is what I plan to do, and here's how, if I got my way, I would allocate and divvy up all of the tax money. And then Congress says, well, tough. You're not going to get to. So why do we even cover it? I have known people who have managed not to tell their editors that the budget was coming out and got away without ever writing a budget story when they were very, very happy about it. We still pay attention to the budget, but we say, what's this tell us about the president's priorities for Northeast Ohio? And we can look at that and say, so, gee, he wants to zero out the uh, Community Development Block Grant program. That has paid for a lot of streetscapes and a lot of landscaping and a lot of community development work in the city of Cleveland. I don't think the mayor would care much for that, so I contact the mayor's office and say, what would you think of zeroing out the Community Development Block Grant Program? And I call other people and they say, well, this would hurt us, you know, millions and millions of dollars. And I look at what is he proposing for the Great Lakes Initiative, where they're going to spend billions of dollars on cleaning up the Great Lakes, because Cleveland is right on the shores of Lake Erie. And I see that... He's going to spend $200 million, or he wants to spend $200 million, and you might say, well, isn't that great? And his budget document might even brag and say, and we're going to continue the Great Lakes cleanup, and we're going to spend $200 million. If you've been covering the town for a while, you might know that, guess what? The same president years ago had pledged to spend $250 million a year, so he's actually cutting back on his promise. And those are the stories we will focus on, or that will be the story that we put together with all of these elements in, in covering the federal budget. And then those issues throughout the year will follow. What happens with the Great Lakes cleanup? How much money does Congress ultimately approve? What happened with it? Did somebody change his or her promise? And, and that sort of thing. That's, that's one of the sorts of things that we do to try to make sense of Washington. We have to look at our congressional delegation. And again, we've got a lot of people to cover. We can't cover them every day. So we try to, to look at them maybe in a, in a smarter way. I'll give you another example here. Um, the president presents his budget, as I said, and it goes to Congress. And Congress makes decisions. And Congress takes all the money that you have provided in taxes and says, well, here's what we want to do with it, and here's how we want to spend it. Have you ever asked yourself, how smart are these guys about spending money? Do they know more than I do? How do they spend their own money? That occurred to me one day. How do they manage their own money? Well, let's look. So I combed through their financial disclosure records, really going back for several years, looked up mortgages and lawsuits and anything that might not show up in the disclosure forms. Um, I learned how the federal retirement system works so that I could better understand the investment choices that they had made in their investment accounts. And I asked a lot of questions about how they spent their money, you know, what, what stocks are in this, what stocks are in that, what about this house, What's, what about that mortgage. Some of them cooperated, some of them were not real happy about it. I put it all in spreadsheets and files, and then I enlisted the help of three professional financial advisors and said, if you were advising them just as you advise other clients, <coughs> what would you tell them? And what mistakes do you see here? And what judgments can you make by looking at this information? And it, was, it was really eye-opening to see that. It was irritating for some. But, you know, it, it showed some fascinating things. And we had a guy who's a very outspoken critic of free trade deals. And yet, his top investment was in a mutual fund whose top holding 
was a Mexican cement company that was accused of violating United States trade policy and trade laws and was at the heart of a years-long trade feud. Now, you might say, you hate this stuff. Why on earth did you invest in that? And isn't that a bit of a contradiction? And his answer was, I didn't even know. I just bought the mutual fund. And I thought that was kind of odd because I knew by just looking at it what it was about. But anyway, that was, that was his excuse. And, and it, it gave us a little bit of a sense of, you know, can they really handle their own money? Here's, here's the story. And, and, you know, what's it say about the way they spend yours? And we broke it out into, uh, I'll find it. Find the jump here, A5. Here we go. Did it kind of visually, because that's a lot of information for a lot of people, and it would be a lot of gray matter. So instead, we did a lot of it visually and just sort of broke it down. And, uh, you know, some of them were happy, some of them were not happy, but that's the way it goes. We provided information for readers that they otherwise might not have. Similarly, as I said, free trade is a big, big, big political issue in Ohio. Every election, you can count on somebody filming a commercial outside of a factory gate, ideally a factory that is closed, and that politician says, used to be workers here. They had good paying jobs. You know, they played by the rules. They got screwed. They're not going to say that in the commercial, but that's, that's the message. They got screwed. And that guy in office, he voted for this stuff. He's not for the working guy. Well, you know, the, the message there is he voted for the trade deals, and the trade deals were bad, and our jobs left for countries like China and Mexico and places that have lower wages and fewer environmental and labor law uh, restrictions. And politicians are, are very good at that, but it's a really, really complicated issue. So we try to drill down in it uh, a lot deeper. When Rob Portman, who you may hear his name as a potential vice presidential pick, um, for, for Mitt Romney. Um, Portman is an Ohio senator. He just uh, won office in 2010. He was George W. Bush's uh, budget chief for a while. He was George W. Bush's trade ambassador for a while. And when he decided to run for Senate, it was obvious he had a record on trade deals and trade negotiations. And we knew that that was going to be a big campaign issue. So as this campaign was gearing up, I was talking for, for quite a while while covering other things with the folks who were working for Portman and working with Portman and with the folks who were working with the Democrats and the Democrat who would run against him and said, we really want to explore this. And we want to explore this before it gets to the he said, she said stage. Because at that point, it becomes impossible to really report a story fairly and fully and inform readers of a darn thing if you're saying, as the candidate, he took our jobs, it's his fault. And you say, as the other candidate, no, I didn't. And I write a story with your charges. I'm not helping anybody. I'm just telling you what people said. So we dug into it, looked at where we thought the fault lines might be, and, and did a very, very thorough job, I think, to the point where when these issues, I'm looking to see if I have a copy here, I guess I don't. When, when these issues would come up on the campaign trail, when indeed one candidate stood outside of a steel plant's gates and held a news conference, I thought this was kind of foolish of him, because the day before I had spelled this out in a story on why it was not Rob Portman's fault. And he said, well, it's Rob Portman's fault, and we would have had these jobs much longer, or something else would have happened had it not been for Portman. It was a whole lot more complicated than that. He was mixing up one kind of steel with another kind of steel. He was mixing up one kind of tariff with another kind of tariff. And this is stuff that nobody would possibly understand without spending a lot of time digging into it. Fortunately, we had. Got to the point where reporters kept calling Portman's office and saying, well, what's your response? And Portman's office said, look up their damn story. Come on, do your homework. But people don't because there's not time. But again, in a Washington bureau, if you can do this, you're providing, you're providing a lot of value for, for your readers back home. Um, similarly, speaking of trade, the Central American Free Trade Agreement. I, I, trade's boring. I mean, I, I hate, hate writing about trade because it's boring, but it's important. And you can break it down in pretty interesting ways. So you'd had a bunch of trade deals that people soured on. You know, you had China Free Trade, you had the North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico and Canada, and you had people saying, we keep losing jobs because of these trade deals. 
then all of a sudden you had the Central American Free Trade Agreement coming up for passage. And you even had, had some moderate Republican uh, Congress members saying, I'm not so sure about this. I believe in free trade, but maybe we need a timeout. Well, we had one of those members in Northeast Ohio. And the day before the vote, he was pretty dead set against it, not because he thought it was a bad deal, but he said, we just need to, to let people breathe and, and feel this out and think it through a little bit better. That vote was at night. He goes in. The vote passed by two votes. He was one of those votes. Voted yes. I call him the next day and say, what gives? I thought you were a no. He said, well, I got a call from a local cabinet maker uh, in uh, uh, Middlefield, Ohio, and they said that they import a lot of Central American lumber, and they say the price of that lumber is killing them because they pay tariffs. They have to pay a special fee for that lumber to come into the United States. And if this trade deal, this Central American Free Trade Agreement passes, those tariffs would be eliminated and they would save a great deal of money. If they don't get that relief, they might have to offshore some of their jobs. And this congressman said, well, I guess I better vote for this. After all, I don't want to lose jobs. He votes for it. The uh, lumber company wouldn't, wouldn't talk at all. I write a story saying that and I get a call from somebody who knows trade who said, I don't believe it. I said, why? They said, because on the books, the law says you have to have these. There's been a side deal that Congress passes every year that exempts everybody from those very tariffs. I said, really? Tell me about it. And this person said, well, if you really under want to understand the issue, talk to so-and-so. Mm -hmm. So I called so-and-so, who is a trade expert, who said, if they are paying tariffs on Central American plywood, I will walk on my hands from the Capitol to the White House. Nobody is paying those tariffs. And I said, well, how do I find that out? And this person said, it's easy. Go here, 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 and here. And I started getting into things like, uh, like tariff, uh, uh, tariff records from the Commerce Department and all sorts of arcane stuff. And it's really, really boring. But I also talked to people who import plywood who said, yeah, nobody, nobody's paying those things on, on Central American lumber. It's just, they're exempt. And I go back to the congressman's office and say, what's the deal? Nobody's paying this stuff. They say, well, we just didn't take their word for it. We went to the trade ambassador's office and asked them, is this true? And the trade ambassador's office sent us the paperwork. I said, show me the paperwork. What the trade ambassador's office sent them was the paperwork saying, yeah, here is a schedule of tariffs. But as I said, there has been a side agreement that Congress has passed every single year that then says, never mind that schedule of tariffs. Nobody has to pay it. I ultimately had a story that said either a congressman was duped or somebody's lying. And I can't say who's lying, but somebody absolutely was duped. Nobody was paying those tariffs. It was embarrassing. The um, White House Trade Office tried to push back and say, you got it wrong. We said, prove it. They couldn't. They, they kept saying, well, you didn't look here. We said, actually, we did. You didn't look there. Actually, we did. And ultimately, they kind of went away and just were, were embarrassed by the whole thing. But again, if you're not there, if Washington bureaus, if people from the Cleveland Plain Dealer and the Houston Chronicle and the Denver Post aren't there to write those stories, then those stories don't get written because there is nobody else watching for those things in, in Washington. So we, we've done these, on, these kinds of things on, on a whole lot of, whole lot of issues. When, when uh, Sherrod Brown, Democrat in, uh, in Congress, um, was about to be, a, when his reelection campaign was about to kick off, and a guy named Josh Mandel, the Ohio treasurer, was going to take him on. We knew that Sherrod Brown is a liberal senator and is accused of being out of step with the state of Ohio. I'm not saying that he is, but that's the rap that the Republicans have. I, I knew that there were going to be a lot of charges lobbed against him. So I talked to Republicans for quite a while and said, what's the rap? Because I know you guys are getting a lot of money and you intend to define this man on TV before he goes on TV. And if you can define him in the minds of voters as a bad guy, maybe you'll win. So prove it. They gave me a lot of stuff, talked to them for a long time. We checked it out by looking at voting records, by looking up legislation, by looking up all sorts of stuff, and ended up doing a story on sort of the two sides of Sherrod Brown. You know, which one is he? Which Sherrod Brown will voters settle on? That's the headline. But the real story is, is the Republican accusation or the Republican case against Sherrod Brown solid or is it not? In some cases it was, but in some cases it absolutely was not. They, they stretched it a bit. And 
That story obviously went on the front page of my paper, but it also ended up as the lead story in the Cincinnati Enquirer, a newspaper downstate, which really surprised me. But I realized nobody's going to do those stories. The Enquirer is not going to do that story, probably, and others aren't going to do that story. So it's kind of nice to, to see another newspaper recognize that, and that then helps inform a lot of the reporting that I'll do in the future. I mean, I'm, I'm already sort of up to speed on these issues. So now when they get into the he said, she said stuff, I know a little bit about these issues. I know a little bit about, about those bills. So anyway, I'm going to wrap up here in, in just a minute. You might say, so, so how do you know these things? You know, what makes you so special? And I'm not claiming to be anything special. I mean, I know this stuff because I'm a Washington reporter, and Washington reporters know how to examine bills, how to examine amendments, how to tell the difference between one amendment and another, how to tell the difference between a vote that passed and a vote that didn't, how to tell the difference between cloture, which is a procedural measure that is needed before a Senate vote can get a, a final vote, and a real or a final vote how to look for Congressional Research Service reports, how to find uh, Congressional Budget Office documents, how to find testimony, how to look in transcripts, uh, especially how to use Federal Election Commission records and really comb them uh, very, very thoroughly and download them into files and sort and, and find things. And, you know, that's, you learn those things simply by working in Washington and, and you can get them by not being in Washington. You could argue, well, you could teach that to somebody back in Ohio. And yeah, you probably could, but I'm, I'm pretty certain that if you didn't have a Washington Bureau, we wouldn't have these kinds of stories because people wouldn't develop those very skills that you develop in, in Washington. Now, was it necessary for my newspaper to have all the reporters we used to have? Was it necessary for every single person who was standing up here in the beginning of my presentation to work for a newspaper? Nah, it might have been overkill. We might have had a few too many. But you need, you need people. I'm going I'm to end by, by telling you a story of what happens regularly in Washington. This has to do with one lawmaker. I'm not going to name him. There are many others who do this. He has a weekly telephone conference call with the press, people who cover him. Now, a few of us in Washington often are on these calls. Mostly it's reporters back in Ohio from papers, large and small, mostly small. And if you work for a small paper, you have to crank out the stories. Your editors have an expectation that you're going to write a lot of stories. That's your job. That's fine. I, I started out a small paper. Lots of people started small papers. And this lawmaker will frame his call uh, around or make his call about a bill he has introduced or something he is promoting or pushing. His goal is to get his name in the papers, get it on TV, get it on the radio in a positive light. And as I said, lots of lawmakers do that. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not going to stay in office if you don't get your name out there. But understand, 95% of all bills that are introduced simply die. Most bills just go away. You never even hear anything else about them. It's easy to introduce a bill. It's very easy. And sometimes the subject of a bill is, is really interesting or compelling. So you could use the fact that somebody introduced a bill as a, an excuse or a reason to write about the larger issue. An example of that would be, let's say, um, uh, safety on, on long distance buses. There was a uh, horrific crash a few years ago uh, of a, uh, a bus, a Greyhound kind of bus that was carrying the baseball team from a university in Ohio. And some players got killed, and it was a horrible thing. And that started a drive to have better safety measures, you know, better rollover measures, better glass, maybe seat belts or other protections, lap restraints, all kinds of things like that. Well, when a bill was introduced to do that, it, it kind of, to, to do those things and to force the, the bus makers to do that, it might make some sense to go ahead and write that story and use the bill introduction, but don't just write about a bill was introduced, but write about the entire issue and what are the economic issues and what's the pushback from the industry and why, you know, and, and who should do this, how much would it cost and would it increase costs, all that stuff, that's fine. But again, most bills die. This particular lawmaker goes on the phone once a week with a bunch of reporters and says, I've just announced a bill. I've just introduced a bill. And I, I'm gonna, these are not real examples because I really do not want to name this person here. Um, I'm going to introduce a bill that's going to cut infectious disease by, let's say, 40%. Or I'm going to improve the living conditions. My bill would improve the living conditions for tens of thousands of Ohioans. Or I'm going to give a chicken to every third household in the state. And I swear, a reporter will ask, 
Well, how many people have better living conditions in, let's say, Adams County? And the lawmaker will say, well, I think uh, about 4,000 based on my calculations. And another reporter will say, how many fewer cases of the common cold will my city have in your, because of your infectious disease bill? And the congressman will have some sort of uh, centers for disease control figures on the common cold and prevalence and duration. And he'll say, you know, if successful, my bill is going to cut the duration of the common cold by 13,000 residents in your city. And I have an, extra, an explanation for this. And some reporter will say, if you're lucky, hasn't this bill come up three times before? But the only person who's going to ask that is going to be your Washington-based reporter. Because the person who's back in Ohio or in Colorado or in Texas has not a clue about that and wouldn't have a reason to have a clue about that. And another reporter, if that reporter has done his or her homework, and the only people who have a reason to do this would be the reporters who cover this stuff all the time, would say, it's October, Congressman. Congress is about to go home. There isn't a corresponding bill in the other House of Congress. You don't have a single co-sponsor. Does this bill really have any chance of passing whatsoever? And often, the lawmaker will concede, yeah, you know, I'm hopeful, but blah, blah, blah. Maybe it'll, this will start the talk, and it'll come up again next week. But I guarantee you, because I checked these, that the next day, there will be headlines in newspapers and small papers that say things like, common cold to be milder in Bucyrus, thanks to lawmakers' bill. Or chickens headed to Scioto County, lawmaker says. I mean, this happens all the time. I'm absolutely dumbfounded. But it's great. The reporter gets a story in the paper, helps his or her byline count, and some people pay attention to that. The newspaper has a Washington story that's with a strong local connection. Editors really like that a whole lot. And the congressman gets his name in the newspaper, and the congressman loves that. But, pardon my language, but that's crap. It, it just is crap. I don't blame the reporters for trying to keep their jobs, but as long as I have a Washington bureau, which I hope will be forever, it's my obligation, it's the obligation of really of every Washington bureau chief to keep that kind of crap out of the newspaper. And, and it is a, a running battle because congressmen are skilled at finding ways to do that. They know that if they show up in the hometown on a Saturday and it's a slow news day, they'll sucker some Metro editor somewhere into covering their event. I mean, we once had a guy uh, who stood on the shores of Lake Erie to talk about a drinking water bill, and arsenic in drinking water. I hate to tell you this, but drinking water doesn't come from Lake Erie. Was, uh, the whole issue had to do with well water. Nothing to do with Lake Erie. TV didn't care. It was a great visual. Uh, again, it, it, it's total crap. And I have an ob really obligation to keep that out of the paper and to provide readers with the kinds of stories that they're not going to be able to get by shaking up Etch-a-Sketches they're not going to read it on the Huffington Post. They're not going to read it on uh, Fox News. They're not going to read it uh, in uh, probably even in the New York Times or the Washington Post because those guys are covering what they're covering and nobody is covering these issues as pertain to Ohio. So I've talked a long time. I'm going to stop and let you guys ask me questions. Anybody? Yes. So so first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, you're making the case for why uh, a Washington bureau is necessary, I think, and why maintaining this close relationship to the city is important. And some of the readings that you assigned for this class was um, the issue of covering the building as opposed to covering issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how the kind of tension that is for you in terms of you have to preserve relationships mm -hmm. and you know, keep kind of, you know, not burn bridges, yet you have to expose uh, important stories. So right. how, do you, how do you balance that? You balance that by remembering your obligation is to the reader. And, and yeah, you have to. And, and sometimes the, the people you cover or the institutions you cover are going to be mad about that. I, here's, a, here's a real example of that. I was on vacation <coughs> not long ago, and um, a... Um, a publication, a blog actually, for, for a publication most people never even read, said that a, a, a lawmaker from Ohio had, uh, was late, was delinquent on his um, property tax bill for a condo he owned in Washington, D.C., and paid it when reminded by a reporter based in Ohio. I, said, really? I got back from vacation and I get a, a, an email on it. I was like, really? My first instinct was, why the hell didn't you leak to me? 
But my second was to send an email to the press secretary for that congressperson and say, is it accurate? And this person said, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, come on, it was one bill. He found out he paid it. It was nothing. And so did he, was there an Ohio reporter who told him about it? According to this blog post, that's what it says. He said, well, you know, look, I, I don't tell other people about your story, so I'm not going to tell you about any conversations I had. <laughs> I learned that there was indeed a, an Ohio-based reporter who, I'm sorry, a Washington-based reporter for another Ohio newspaper who'd, who'd found this out and thought, come on, it was one single property tax bill. It wasn't for a whole lot of money. It's not that big a deal. It he spends three days, maybe four days in Washington. His home is back in Ohio. It comes in the mail with all the other junk. He misses it and, you know, not a big deal. And we had a conversation about this. I said, I would have put it on the blog. I would have let editors decide if it was right for the newspaper. But I would have put it on the blog just because I don't think I ought to be protecting anybody. I ought to just get it out there. And he probably wouldn't have been happy about that. But because of that, we decided, we being me and my editor, let's look deeper. And we started looking through online property records. And I found pretty darn quickly that the same thing had happened five years ago, three consecutive quarters in a row, to the point where the District of Columbia um, had what was the equivalent of a tax lien on his property. They, they had his property on a list of what they call tax sales, where somebody could have bought the rights, or a right at least, and had an attachment and a lien on his property by paying his taxes. That's a really foolish thing to do. Now this guy has a conference call this very day on a subject of one of these you know, meaningless sorts of things, and he says, I will take other questions, and First question is from another reporter. He says, well, why don't you clear the air on this? What was this about? And he says, uh, you know, I just, I mislay, misplaced it. I didn't see it. As soon as I found out, I paid it. It's not a big deal. It'll never happen again. And I jumped in and said, but it happened three times before, five years ago, to the point where you had a tax lien. And he said, yes, that's true. That was a mistake, uh, blah, 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 blah. And indeed, you know, we certainly put that in the newspaper. Was his office happy about that? Not at all. But, you know, it's news. You've got to do it. I, the, the, most, of the, most of the people who, who work for politicians or who work for these institutions realize you're doing their, your job and they're doing their job. And they may be really angry at you for a little while. They may be angry at you for longer than a little while. But you're doing your job. Yes? I know you've done some work with political PAC. Yeah. So could, what is PolitiFact sure. and uh, what purpose do you think it serves? Well, PolitiFact is a, a, a web-based, although it exists in print as well, web-based service that was started by the St. Petersburg Times in the last presidential election um, because the guy who had the idea to do it, who was an old friend of mine from St. Petersburg when I worked there, um, got tired of the talk, got tired of the he said, she said. And when you cover a campaign, day in, day out, somebody's making an accusation, somebody's making a claim, somebody's taking credit for something. And the question that anybody should have is, is that true? If, if, if it makes you say, huh, or can that be accurate? Why don't we check it out? So he decided to start a service that does just that. He did it strictly with the presidential election in the last cycle, covering uh, Obama versus McCain. And he put it on the web, made it very transparent. Everything he checks, he, he gives a source for and links it, but created a meter, what's called a truth of meter, which is a gimmick. And the truth of meter starts with true, which means everything that was said is true, mostly true, which is, it's true, but there are a couple extra things you ought to know, because otherwise there's a context that makes it slightly misleading. Half true, which means factually it may be accurate, but it was told in a way that gives you a very different impression and gives the person way more credit or way more blame than he or she deserves. Um, what has now become mostly false, which is, it's got a touch of truth, but it's mostly just way out there. False, which means it's dead wrong, and Pants on Fire, where the logo is, is flames coming out of a meter. And Pants on Fire is, it's ridiculous. Come on now. Um, and so they did that. Uh, again, it's called PolitiFact.com. St. Petersburg Times started it, and they would run it in the St. Petersburg Times. A couple of years ago, they decided to expand it in other states and partner with uh, newspapers, ideally one newspaper in every state. So my newspaper, Cleveland Plain Dealer, partnered with them to create PolitiFact Ohio. And we, you know, we do things on um, members of Congress, congressional candidates. We do president when it relates to Ohio. Our stuff will run on PolitiFact.com. 
and PolitiFact Ohio, PolitiFact.com stuff will run in PolitiFact Ohio. And it, it's now uh, got quite a presence. It exists in, I don't know how many states, 12, 15 states, I'm not sure, in a lot of places. There are other services that do this. There's something called factcheck.org, which is run by the um, Annenberg Center on Public Policy at, uh, at Penn. Uh, the Washington Post has something called Fact Checker. They use uh, Pinocchios and Pinoc they have like one Pinocchio, two Pinocchio, three Pinocchios, or four Pinocchios to uh, deal with the extent of the, the lie or the misstatement. And it, it's sort of accountability journalism that, uh, that says, you make a claim, you know, words, words matter, and we're going to hold you accountable and responsible for your words. I love it. Um, because again, I get really tired of it, as you can tell. I get really tired of the he said, she said stuff. And I, I don't think the he said, she said stuff serves anybody. It certainly doesn't serve a, a, a reader or a voter in the middle who doesn't know what to make of all this stuff. So that's, that's what, what the fact is. We have time for one more question. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So um, I worked a little bit in DC uh, this past summer. My question is, um, what do you think of the overall quality of the coverage of the budget deal? I mean, there's a lot of this, like you say, he said, she mm -hmm. said, going on like to the end degree. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the overall quality? I think a lot of that coverage of the, of the budget, you've, you've got two kinds of coverage of the budget deal, first of all. You've got people who, who legitimately have to cover the budget because it's their job. You know, you, you work for the Associated Press or you work for uh, uh, a news service and your job is to indeed cover budgets. And so they're going to do sort of a straightforward job. And then you have everybody else who's looking at the political angle on it. And it's very, very hard to remove the political angle on a budget in this Congress with, with such a, a wide divide between the Senate and the House. And I think you, you even, even have, have what, realistically, any reporter has to say, this budget is not going to pass the entire Congress. It can't. There are not the votes for it. It can't, can't happen. So that frames some of the coverage. So then you're looking at, again, the budget, Paul Ryan's budget as a political document, because it indeed has, has legitimacy as a budget document, but it also has legitimacy as a political plan. And you have to recognize that. I, don't, I can't speak to the quality, because I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm reading some of it and I'm thinking, this budget's not going to pass. Why are we getting so worked up here? But I'm interested in it as a political plan, because it does tell me if Paul Ryan controlled Congress, here is what his priorities would be, or here is what might happen uh, with, with uh, entitlement programs, or here's what might happen with taxes, or, or here's what might happen with discretionary spending. I don't think there has been a massive amount of, of um, sort of deep diving into, into the figures, what's realistic, what's not realistic, but, but there's been a fair amount of that. You can certainly find that. You'll find that in the Washington Post. You'll find that, I think, in the New York Times. You'll find that in, in uh, Politico. And then you see, you know, the extreme ends. You see, you see uh, 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 Weekly Standard, uh, uh, Fox, um, a couple of others, you know, treating it very seriously. And then you see Huffington Post taking pot shots at it. But that's to be expected. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of partisan in their coverage. So. What about the debt ceiling um, issue there? Because I was totally it's a political mm -hmm. what, what, what about that? Well, the problem with that is it's political, but it had to it had to pass. Unlike the budget, I mean, they get that. You could say a budget should pass. Absolutely, a budget should pass. You got to have a plan for how you're going to spend our money. But a budget doesn't have to pass, as we've now seen. That ceiling has to pass, and and that had very serious consequences. And that's why I think there was a bit of a difference there, and that's why people I think took the debt ceiling a lot more seriously. We are out of time. Please join us the reception and join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you.